Welcome to Canada Bangladesh Social Justice Action Research Alliance. On this platform, we talk about issues that impact social justice locally and globally. Today, I'm very excited that we'll be talking about a very prominent writer in Bangladesh. Prominent Bangladeshi writer Shwedo Zahi is known for his extraordinary prose style and diction. Zahi is considered by many the founder of postmodern fiction in Bengali literature. Many literary critics call him the Marquez of Bangladesh for carrying on the legacy of magic realism with strokes of his own unique surrealist style deeply imbibing Bangladesh's politics, history, and culture. A maestro storyteller, Shahidul Zahi, who could hypnotize his readers with his literary spells, died of a massive heart attack in uh, 2008 in his, at, in his prime, only when he was only aged 54. Today, we will discuss with, what, about, discuss with a prominent and very uh, notable scholars and literary figures about uh, Shaitul Zahir's one of the prominent work, um, life and political reality. And first of all, I have to begin this conversation thanking Ramada. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible without the generous uh, collaboration Ramada has done. I mean, Ramada is an excellent and organic collaborator. I don't know how Ramada does it. Uh, but, you know, thank you very much. I look forward to learning and hearing uh, from all of you. Um, so I will just introduce our distinguished panel in the beginning. So we have with us Dr. Syed Jamil, theater director and independent scholar. Uh, we have with us, uh, well, Dr. Shakir uh, Hassan al -Zai, uh, Zaid. he was supposed to join us because of personal circumstances and family emergency, uh, he couldn't join us. We have with us uh, V. Ramaswamy, translation activist, and of course, the <laughs> main organizer of today's event. We have with us Iqbal Hasnu, editor of uh, bilingual Bangla journal published from Toronto and Kolkata, and Sharoza Nari, uh, literary translator. So without uh, further ado, I welcome you all for the conversation. And uh, I begin by requesting um, our, uh, I, I think the first event, Hold on a second, please. I'm having technical difficulties. Okay, so may I request now Ramada to uh, give us uh, a, a summary of you know the thing that we're going to talk about today, and uh, everybody welcome for our conversation. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you to uh, Firoz for organizing this. And it is most uh, timely, 50 years of Bangladesh and. Uh, on that occasion to commemorate that with the discussion on this uh, novella and uh, it will be followed by its publication very shortly, I hope. So uh, I had requested uh, Dr. Sarkar Hassan al Zaid to uh, write an essay on this uh, novella and uh, he kindly agreed and he sent it and I liked it very much and so the volume that will come out in Bangladesh shortly. Uh, it's a commemorative volume that also includes uh, this essay as well as an essay by Said Jamil Ahmed uh, about uh, taking it to stage. So since uh, Dr. Al Zaid is absent today for personal reasons, I will uh, read a summary uh, or, or edited version of his essay. It's called Reading Shahidul Zahir, Reading Bono Rajnoitik Bastavata. The context. It is Shahidul Zahir's first novel, Jivono Rajnoitik Bastavata, a work that he wrote in his mid-30s and a work that stands at a meager 48 pages that is now considered his most successful literary endeavor. The eminent Bangladeshi writer Hassan Azizul Haq as well as the renowned poet and fiction writer Mohibul Aziz hailed Jibono Rajnoitik when it came out. The acclaimed writer Debesh Roy from West Bengal in India had pointed out that Zahir is the very embodiment of a distinctively Bangladeshi tradition. It is in his work that he observed the line of demarcation separating Bangladeshi fictional tradition from the one followed in West Bengal. There is widespread consensus among scholars and readers about the centrality of Jibono Rajnoitik in the history of Bangladeshi fiction. In some ways, following Frederick Jameson, one can call it a national allegory, albeit with the definite, definitive markers of the nation's inscriptions within the global capitalist system being pushed to the backdrop in it. However, it is not its theme alone that makes this novel remarkable. It is simultaneously its prose, 
the novelty and the idiosyncratic cadences of its narrator's voice that accords this work its distinctive identity. At the heart of Zahir's thematic pre preoccupation in this work lie both the political and social failures of the nation. The direction that Bangladeshi politics took after its independence, embracing military dictatorship after 75 and rehabilitating local collaborators of the Pakistani army troubled Zahid deeply. The political resistance that began to shape up into a social movement during General Ershad's rule casts its shadow on this novella. The tenor of loss and anger that permeates this work is indeed an articulation of the collective disappointment that the nation experienced in that era. What is also heard in the orchestra of despair, and this is the note that remains concealed under the more pronounced vibrato of anger and resignation, is the deep distrust of the ruling elite who facilitated the rise of religious extremism in exchange for power and money. It is the schism of the body politic that thus remains at the heart of the novel's representation. Although such a split in the collective imaginary has been explored in Zahir's work through the trauma and confusion of a single individual, making the subject bear witness to the nation's ordeals. Grotesque violence and hyper-masculinity. Jibono Rajnaitik develops its plot around the quandary of a young man named Abdul Mojid, who rather, whose rather mundane universe gets shattered one morning in 1985 when he hears the voice of Maulana Bodhu's son, Abul Khair, on the mic. The novel begins with a subtle analogy between the snapped string of the young man's sandal and his heartbreak occasioned by Khair's announcement. The return and rehabilitation of Bodhu, who, during the war, not only orchestrates the rape and murder of Mojid's elder sister, Momina, but also holds the whole community hostage, killing people at will and feeding their flesh to crows, troubles and disgusts Mojid so much that he decides to sell his ancestral home and move elsewhere. The beginning of the novel brilliantly captures the young man's qualm and bafflement through a series of evocative surreal images which vividly, vividly articulate his carefully concealed despair. As Mojid looks up to locate the source of the sound he has just heard, he notices that the sky has gone dark with terrified flying termites. And feasting on them are crows who seem to have flown out of Abul Khair's long tunic. The terror unleashed on the horizon by flying crows is deeply suggestive in the context of the novel because of these birds' association with Bodhu, whose rapaciousness is mirrored by the praying bird's rapturous flight. The traumatic moment in which Mojid comes to understand the likeness between himself and the termites is also the moment when he cognitively processes his own precariousness, understanding now that the nation's independence has not brought any respite from predators like Molana Bodhu. National independence has not ushered in any qualitative change in his material life and circumstances. It is his apprehension of his and his family's precariousness, his understanding that his wife and daughter may suffer the same fate suffered by his sister that convinces the young man to leave his neighborhood and its community. The novel's beginning thus casually relates to its closure binding these two moments in a progression of succession where we see Mojid's initial alarm about his own precariousness leading him towards his resolution to move out of old Dhaka. Contained between these two moments, the beginning and the closure, are his community's past experiences, especially its memories of 1971. How, when Dhaka city was under siege, Bodhu and his sons fed the crows from their roof and how the community gradually discovered the gruesome reality behind the feeding of the crows. All these are explored in detail at the beginning of the novel. The grotesqueness of the event not only forces one to revisit the horror that the local population experienced during the city's siege, but also compels one to think of the perversion of the mind engaged in such sickening violence.
the inhumanity of the collaborator who having brought into the narrative having bought into the na narrative of national unity and religious purity unleashes terror on his own neighbors and fellow citizens is further highlighted by the use of use of grotesque realist descriptions yet it would be remiss not to notice how the hyper violence of godu is also underwritten not only by a hyper masculinist performative gesture but also by the fear of loss of masculinity itself it is not simply his egotistic pursuit of power and preponderance but also his fear and anxiety of being perceived as weak and epicene that propels bodu forward towards violent actions his masculinity is threatened by the sight of the penis of a teenager urinating and by his wife's recognition of his severed penis as that belonging to a muslim he has the boy killed and divorces his wife summarily the conjunction between bodu's grotesque violence and his fear of emasculation can be located in many other descriptions for instance relating to the protagonist sister momena who unlike the other muslim girls of the mohalla sings and takes part in the church choir thus exhibiting an audacity to violate the strict cultural norm imposed on the girls of that community her defiance she refuses to be cowed down by bodu's threats and continues to live in the same vicinity turns her into a target of his rage likewise in his desperate attempt to conceal the identity of his hermaphrodite first child one notices an overcompensatory gesture directed towards erasing the signs of his child's stipulated weakness he thus sublates his child's identity into his own seeking in the process to reinscribe a body that has already been inscribed by nature the reinscription of the hermaphrodite body according to a ma masculine master code exemplifies the degree to which bodu's actions are reflective of his fear of emasculation leading us the readers to ponder about the nature of the trauma that underwrites such hypermasculinist projections the structure of the political it is important to bear in mind that zahir's novel is as much about bodu's reign of terror in 1971 as it is about his rehabilitation in 1985 within the mainstream of politics mojid's disgust which stems from the memories of the past predominantly corresponds to the political climate of the 1980s when collaborators like bodu once again became relevant in national politics the novella thus affords us a vantage into the superficial antagonism between the anti-national comprador and the national bourgeoisie showing how the facade of antagonism falls apart when such people get a whiff of the opportunity for power and here uh, the author uh, talks about franz fanon and his work and especially the wretched of the earth and about uh, his comments on the national bourgeoisie and their betrayal and although he gives a caveat that there are differences between the context but nevertheless uh, a major point is that one often forgets that the novella is not only a repudiation of molana bodu's values and politics but also a strong rebuke to aziz pathan's supine nationalism that relies on bodu's reactionary politics to maintain its grip on power the betrayal of pathan is thus the key to the novel's exploration of post independence bangladeshi history style and narration what is equally important about the novella is its formal and linguistic challenge to bengali literary convention the entire novella is written in a single paragraph emulating in form the tense nervousness and antipathy its protagonist feels after hearing molana bodu's son's announcement on the mic while such stylistic registers are not entirely unfamiliar in literature what is significant about his this formal deployment is its ability to convey in form the feelings and evo emotions evoked in the minds of fictional characters experiencing history the thematic development from the moment of an apparently trivial event in the life of a young abdul mojid the snapping and coming apart of his sandal strap and his more consequential decision to sell his ancestral home and move to a different place 
is a progression constantly disrupted by memories that are not only traumatic but also occasionally bizarre and grotesque. The movement from the crisis of the beginning and the decisive moment of the closure is formally counterpointed by a tight narrative that exudes breathlessness. It is in the harmonious orchestra of form and content, style and thematic development that Mojid's trauma and agony unburden themselves. The counterintuitive confluence between disinterestedness and emotionality that Hassan Azizul Haq identified as a defining feature of the novella's prose demands careful consideration. Although Zahir's first novella is a fruit of anger, the narrator remains unaffected by it, describing even the most compelling moments with a stoical disinterestedness. When, for instance, Mojid discovers the body of his sister at the bank of the Budiganga River, raped and bayoneted to death, he is so distraught that he sits down beside her and, quote, sobbing as if unhinged, Allah, Allah, unquote. This emotionally crushing moment of the novel's protagonist's life, one which is pivotal to the novel's development and closure, is described e economically within a space of five brisk sentences. Likewise, the horrifying moment of discovering the severed body part that results in Bodhu's divorce is narrated lightheartedly in a tone of banter. Another defining feature of the novella's prose is its conscious blending of the formal or archaic and the informal or local dialect. Considered a flaw in the traditional grammar, grammar books, Guru Chandali or mongrel mongrelization of Cholito that is spoken and Shadhu that is formal forms of Bengali language has been deliberately employed as a narrative strategy in Zahir's first novella, thus breaking the grammarian's taboo. One of the reasons why it reads so differently from other novels written in the same era is its inventive language, which turns a grammatical flaw into an effective storytelling technique. More importantly, it has created a fictional community in which such narrative idiosyncrasies do not seem out of place, <clears throat> nor do they seem outlandish. Although such a significant linguistic experiment appears unremarkable today because many other Bangladeshi writers following Zahir <clears throat> have used similar techniques. When the novel was first published in 1987, such admixture, even for creative reasons, was seen as a limitation, something a young writer was taught to avoid. The novella broke from such traditional manuals. The linguistic experiment may not appear as significant today as it was back then, but almost quietly, it changed the way critics envision literary language today. In his very first novel, Zahid thus fashioned a new narrative conven convention, although only a handful of readers, if any at all, were conscious of it when it was published. Conclusion. Jibono Rajnoitik Bastabata was the fruit of a new zeitgeist. It was written in an era in which not only culture, but also the economic foundation of the state was changing rapidly. Such changes echoed in the sphere of culture as well. With gradual erosion of the idea of the social and with institutional reforms that mandated the placing of personal profit over national interest, a new culture devoid of any affinity for collectivization emerged. At its helm was the atomized individual who internalized the ideology that human beings were essentially alone and that the pursuit of individual happiness at any cost was not only just, but also ethical. The gradual erosion of all forms of utopian collective imagination and the emergence of an acutely subjectivist frame of understanding that freed the subject from any ethical responsibility towards the nation or the community, ushered in a new culture. It was a culture that condoned corruption and measured success and failure entirely in terms of money. 
devoid of depth and introspection the new culture vested its soul in commodities turning objects into the ultimate denominator of social significance and happiness of course it took decades for this culture to become ubiquitous but its early features were already on display in the mid 80s <coughs> when general ershad was ruling the country aesthetically the new wave of postmodernist visions that were spelled out in europe and elsewhere at the end of the 60s began to nestle in other parts of the world in the two decades that followed in bangladesh particularly a new generator generation of writers emerged who aided by the ideas that were floating around began to consciously incorporate postmodern techniques and visions in their works zahir was among them although it is difficult to describe him as such these then are the realities that contour the backdrop of jibono rajnaitik conditioning the historical context in which abdul mojid's frustrations are vented out in the novella however a critical absorption of the ascending neoliberal order takes place in the form of unburdening the trauma and tribulations of a community by using a particular individual as a narrative container one cannot help observing how mojid is a mere catalyst in the novel facilitating the emergence of the story of his community after the first moment of initiating the story mojid gets almost entirely erased from the narrative only to be brought back at the end to bring the narrative to the close there are of course moments in which he resurfaces in the story but such reappearances are sublated into the broader narrative of the community's collective experiences he is the bearer of his community's pain an embodiment of their sufferings when one reads zahir's first novella one cannot shake off the impression that for him the collective remains the fundamental premise premise of the political and not vice versa the nostalgia for a lost collective universe continues to haunt the content of his novella jibono rajnaitik is neither a socialist document nor a postmodernist one if anything it is a novella about a historical moment when collaborators aided by state power and self-centered politicians re-emerged to terrorize ordinary people and communities in many ways it is a narrative of defeat losing hope for justice mojid leaves the mohalla he has been an organic part of the hope brought in by the liberation war is lost in the despair of discovering the truth that his community has surrendered to bodu the only redemptive aspect of the narrative is its protagonist's optimistic rage that he declines to accept the reality and chooses to begin afresh elsewhere it is this hapless utopian belief in a new beginning that allows us to read the novella not only as a narrative of despair but also as a novel of hope thank you so much for your patient listening thank you ramada as i was listening to you and uh, when i was uh, when i read the uh, novella of, uh, first in bangla um i felt that its capacity to be able to explain a social reality that is so complex and so layered particularly those of us who have been in academia for a long time particularly in the global north a lot of the times we understand the burden of eurocentricity in our epistemic foundation pretty much everything that we read is in a eurocentric what happens that it creates a kind of gap <laughs> where we think that our own organic understanding of our social reality cannot inform our critical perspective so in in such a place uh, the uh, work of shahid zahir and the translation of his work is immensely important uh, uh, i would say particularly to combat one particular phenomena which is epistemic violence so the translation is immensely important um uh, i would request mr iqbal hasnu to speak uh, to that point is that why the translation of zahir's work is so important and timely given the point where we are now thank you mr feroz alam and uh, so as i mentioned earlier that uh, since Rama Sami indicated me to that is speak in English, so I have uh, jotted down that of what I'd like to say. So I'm just reading out from there. 
First of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Feroz Alam to organize this webinar on writer Shahid al Jahir and his works. I'm really honored to get involved in this webinar to share, up, share my thoughts and reflection on how I have come across Shahidul's works and why I felt his works need to be translated for the non-Bengali readers. So I will go step by step then. Mm. Yeah. My encounter with Shahidul Jahir's writings, how it happened. Although I was not an avid reader of fiction back home, I mean in Bangladesh during the late 1780s, while I was still a post-secondary student in Chittagong. Yet it was my pastime to give a visit to cities a couple of bookstores every alternate day and to pick up whatever the new little magazines used to show up on their display racks and tape desks. It was a time of poets who dominated the literary scene and the minuscule market of publications in Bangladesh. Who we who were young readers and always yearning for something new, unconventional and table breaking in fictions could not find any new voice yet. Poets, however, were not in a short supply during that period. In fiction, it was still the stalwarts of the 60s, like Hassan Azizul Haq, Akhtar Zaman Ilyas, Mahmudul Haq, Rizia Rahman, Syed Samsul Haq, and even renowned poet Al Mahmud with his single volume of short stories named Pan Kori Rokto, their main stay. On that, we were very much trying ourselves, keeping a pace with the West Bengal's literary scene through various little magazines like Porichoy, Onustu, Choturongo, Bigapon, Porbo, Desh, etc. Fiction writers like Shishan, Hashweta Devi, Kamal Kumar Mojumda, Sunil Gangopadhyay, Shandipan Chattopadhyay, Shamanush Bosu and Shamanush Mojumdar were on staples. But to add a distinct spice to our main staple, we had to engage ourselves with writers like Tushar Das. Now, a lot of people don't know him because he read, he wrote only one single novella uh, and he died very young. Uh, then Subimal Misro and Obhijit Shen. I came to know Obhijit Shen uh, by reading his Rahul Har in uh, periodical Onustu. During my stay in Bangladesh, up until 1987, before immigrating to Canada, I never heard of Shahidul. The only young short story writer who drew our attention was Badal Arifin. And interestingly, his short stories were translated in English. Some of translated short stories was published from Dhaka. I'm afraid to say that the consideration for translating Arifin's stories have been given by the publisher not for their literary merits but for mere friendship. Indeed, it was just a mere coincidence that I came across Shuljohir's writings through one of his one of his classmates and friends, very close friends, Ikramullah Chaudhary, the younger brother of our renowned Dr. Jafarullah Chaudhary. In 1988-89 period, my family and I shared a rented apartment in Toronto. During that period, 
a brief visit to Bangladesh upon return, Ikram gave me a copy of the Jibono Rajanoitik Bastubota and told me that his friend's book for me. I can't remember what was my reaction uh, or how I felt after giving a quick read, but for sure I was struck by its unconventional narrative style. Zahir cast a deep impression in my mind in 1992 when I first read his short story, Dumur Kheko Manushera, in the little magazine called Prakritu, edited by none other than the stalwart Hassan Azizul Haq. Hassan, in his attentioning writer, Abhijit Sen, right, just quote from there. The next story in our lineup is of Shahidul Johir, whom I don't know in person. I heard he's still young in age. I only read his lone novella. By reading the current short story, readers can easily understand that the writer is trying to write in his new style and in a new language. So that is the beginning. From then on, I started to collect his books whenever I got a chance, whenever I got a chance. Eventually, I became familiar with his other two novels, Sherate Purnima Chilo and Mukher Dike Dekhi, and a collection of short stories. I met Shahidul Johir in 2003 in his government quarter in Dhaka. Zahir, however, kind enough to grab uh, intend to get an interview of, uh, of him for my Bangla journal. We agreed to have that interview of him be taken by He also promised a short story for for my journal. I was his works. In 2008, when we were preparing the issue of the journal as planned, Zohi reassured me over the phone that he has already cooked up a short story for the journal and is just waiting to lay it out on the paper. But alas, a few, few weeks later, I got the set that he is no longer with us. Why Shahid uh, al-Jahir is important and why he deemed unique? To answer this question, I will quote from two observations. One is by no other than Hassan Azizul Haq, and the other one, novel laureate, Austrian novelist Alfie Yelinek. Hassan, in his article, Shona Mora Kotha Shilpi, or Gilded Prose Writer, wonders, what is the secret of Shohidul's power as a writer? He has used a very used a old anadu, a mesmerizing jugglery, no doubt, which is the language. Hassan then continued with his own analysis of Shohidul's use of language, which I'm not going to elaborate further, but I would like to draw your attention to his final remark where he compared Shohidul's uniqueness against his predecessors. Hassan says, Shohidul is neither Sayyid Waliullah nor Akhtar Zaman Ilyas. Now, the second observation which I mentioned earlier is from an, uh, um, is from an article on Alfrede Yelinek. So this is the quotation. What does language make, make happen? Asks a character towards the beginning of her, not all her. The Austrian writer Alfred Yelenik's 1998 play of the life of Robert Walser. In typical Yelenik fashion, the title is itself preoccupied with language. The character soon answers their questions 
language is worth as little as life itself for it is life itself end of the quote so here i think i have made an attempt to establish that shohidul's arrival in the bangla literary scene has made a turning point in uh in terms of expanding the horizon of linguistic possibilities in narrative style. In short, instead of expressing the theme or message of the of, of the content through a singular protagonist voice, he made polyphonic voice of a group, of a locality of a culture, of a nation, into a singular, without altering their multiplicities. Without further elaborating on his linguistic crafts, I would like to mention another unique aspect of Shahiro, which many critics alluded to. It is his power of keeping readers in a trance, an uncertainty, by a repetitive use of adverbs like haito, perhaps, or inflection of boy like Kimba or Othoba. In one of my articles regarding Shahidul's short stories, I have explained in details this aspect with plenty of examples. Not only of, for his unique linguistic device, Shahidul needs to be read for his deep archaeal reflections upon Bengal's history its marginals and the liberation war and its aftermath. Now, how I came to pursue Ramasamy to translate Shahidul's works. Living abroad in an English dominated country and working for a bookstore for several years privileged me to compare the state of our literature with that of other regions. I'm very much aware of the limitations of this comparison. Since I'm not versed in any other foreign language other than English, so I don't know what's happening in other European, Asian, African, Middle Eastern, Latin American languages. We, the people of subcontinent, mostly rely on English translations to meet our cravings for foreign literature. And conversely, we try to make our literature available for world readers through English, as it has been, become the world's lingua franca. In and around 2006, I casually picked up a copy of Elinex's novel, Women as Lovers, from our bookstore shelf, just out of curiosity, since she was awarded Nobel Prize recently, and there were hardly any translations of her works in English available. While I was reading that novel, I felt that the translation was somewhat awkward or missing something. Later, my suspicion was proved not to be far off. I read somewhere that the critics often uh, uh, lamented the facts that the poor translation of Elinix works uh, re rendered her an obscure position among the world readers. I, however, was mesmerized by her craft and the drab, uh, drab monotonous ambience she had created in her novel. It is a coincidence that during that period, I received an unsolicited email from V. Ramasamy with an excerpt of his translations of Manoranjan Bepari's autobiographical novel. I was quite surprised to receive his email and his voluntary proposal to publish the translations in the Bangla Journal. Ramaswamy surprised me for his choice of Bangla works that he felt compelled to translate. His choice was unique. Instead of picking up popular mainstream entertaining literature, he dived for those writers who were in the margin, like Madaranjan, 
and experimental and unconventional like Suvi Mogmisro. I felt an urge to approach him with Shohidul's work because I voluntarily sent some of Shohidul's works to my few literary, few literary and editorial mentors in Kolkata uh, several years ago, but none of them showed any interest in his works. I felt that they were not familiar with Shohidul's use of local dash and deemed the territory is too unfamiliar for them. Fortunately, Ramasamy picked up my suggestion and he jumped on with zeal and passion that is beyond my expectation. The rest you can hear from Ramasamy himself. To conclude, I would like to draw your attention to one glaring truth about translation. Not something, but a valuable aspect of any literary work will always be lost in translation because something new in any language will always remain untranslatable. So it might have happened to Shoidu's works translated by Ramasamy as well. So I'm just uh, trying to conclude with a couple of uh, thing, uh, examples uh, regarding the, my last point, which I mentioned already in my article on Shoidu Jahir's which in intervention on Shoidu Jahir. Here I'm just trying to draw your attention to one little sentence from uh, <clears throat> one of his short stories. Uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, let me see what, it, what, what was that. Okay, I, I don't remember that uh, the title of the short story, but it's just one uh, little line I'm just reading out in Bangla. Grammar Lokera Jokon Bole, Tor Mayata, Tor Harais of a Boer Nahal Husere Akalu, Jokon Bokul Hata Bapata Boche, Ottoba Kichu Bojena. Now, Huisere Akalu, this ray, is actually expressing something that is not translatable. The ray, which is an for the what you call the, uh, the for the verb. But the race is a part of the local dialect. And here it is expressing something that is more than uh, the, the verb actually express, which is, which is have done or is, it has become. But the ray is adding something and nuance. I don't think it can be captured in translation. So that's what I'm trying to draw attention to the limitations of translations, which I found that it's also happened to Alfred Yelinek, a powerful writer. So I think uh, that the, the, there are other uh, professors, say Jamil Ahmed will elaborate more on Shahid al uh, works. Uh, here I would like to conclude uh, my thoughts on Shavidul Jahir's importance. Thank you so much, Mr. Iqbal Hasnu. Um, I was smiling and I was thinking, you know, Sharoza is probably <laughs> carrying a huge burden on her shoulders because uh, Sharoza is uh, doing her uh, graduate research on <laughs> Shahidul Zahid's work and translating someone's work that is deeply embedded into social, political, cultural context into a different language is a monumentally challenging task. So I'm sure that you know we will be uh, very grateful to hear Shara's thinking and in her process of thought process and understanding. I want to move to Professor um, Jamil Ahmed. Uh, before I uh, request Jamil, uh, Professor Jamil Ahmed, I want to just uh, quickly remember my own conversation with my father. My father is a freedom fighter. And uh, my father did not have the privilege to go to college university. And a lot of the times when I would want to understand 1971 with my father, one day he looked me in the eye directly and said something that, look, you were not born in 1971. You haven't seen what 1971 is. So I may not have gone to colleges and universities, but there are certain understandings that don't come from the pages of books. So Professor Jamil Ahmed is not only an eminent scholar in Bangladesh, uh, he's also a freedom fighter. He has seen 1971. For him, it's not epistemological. It's something that is within his lived experience. And um, 
I read something from uh, Gramsci's uh, Prisons Notebook where Gramsci talks about is that you know our responsibility, intellectual responsibility of life is to see what kind of traces of consciousness that we have in our life and to make sense of it, to make sense of our reality. So I request uh, Professor uh, Jamil Ahmed to talk about um, Shahid al-Zahid and how his experience, his lived experience, what he has seen in 1971 and reading Shahid al-Zahid and also being such an eminent figure in the, uh, in the, in the areas of drama, theater, uh, help us to understand Zahid's work in more depthness. Uh, may I request Professor Jamil Ahmed? Thank you. Thank you. Um, to begin, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I, uh, it is a huge pleasure. And of course, it has happened through Rama. So thank you also, Rama, and thank you, everybody. Now, thank you for introducing me, uh, giving me the lead on, on, on the, freedom, uh, the liberation war for those, if I may call you that. Because indeed, uh, that was the, uh, the crucial crucial tie, link for me and and Gibbon uh, Rajvedi Vastabhata. Well, my subject position is clearly a non-practicing Muslim, a citizen of Bangladesh, and a freedom fighter uh, in the liberation war of 1971. And that, and, and, and that indelible image of, of 71 uh, uh, really uh, motivated me to see the play or the novel or the novella as, as, as it is. I was only in class 10 at that time in 1971 when my father woke me up at 2 a.m. in the morning um, on 26 March in 1971. And from our flat in Shittashwari in Dhaka City, I saw, we, uh, he gave me and I saw, I looked south and, then I, and I saw Dhaka City burning. Uh, after two days, when the curfew was lifted, I didn't ask permission. I just rushed out of my house and then in Shiddashari, went to Shantinagar Bajar, then Naya Bajar, the timber market. They were all deserted. And so I realized when I, when I reached Naya Bajar, then it was Naya Bajar that I, that, I, that I had seen burning. It was a timber market and crores and crores of, of, uh, of taka worth of timber or rupees worth of timber were burned on that night, beside other things that happened. So as I was walking from Shiddashari, through Shantinagar to Gulistan and Naya Bazaar. I saw in front of Gulistan a man lying dead. I still remember the sight. The, 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 the cannon was still there. The streets were deserted, of course, but the man was lying lying on the street. The, 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 the dead body seemed fresh, but his skull was split open. And my first impression was it was like 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 marmalous, like cod bell, cod bell struck open. And that was what 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 the, what the skull inside looked like. It couldn't have been, it could, must have been overnight. That man was lying over there. And after that, no one needed to convince me about, about, you know, about Pakistan or Bangladesh. Till that time, before that, I was an avid supporter of, of, of Pakistan. I was a student of Azhar at Kirit College, and I was brought up in a, in a milieu where Pakistan comes first above anything else. But, but the horrendous sight of 25th March that I saw on 26th March, 27th March, uh, after that, there was there was no question of Pakistan. It had to be Bangladesh, and I joined the Liberation War, and uh, I was a freedom fighter and I operated in Pakistan City, uh, and and so that made uh, that was a very very deep deep impression made a very deep Im impression in me. After the war, of course, uh, I was a student at the Dhaka University for one year in English literature, but after that, I switched to, over to theatre. And I've been a practitioner since uh, 1975 when I joined National School of Drama. Now, um, uh, what happened after after 1971, after 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 liberation, is a painful history, and that is what what really jolted me when I read Jibon uh, Rajni Big Vastavata. Firstly, uh, there, there have been films on, on liberation war, crude films made in uh, Dhaka. Uh, some some, of course so-called art films that they, they tried to capture the reality but they were kind of very uh difficult and very uh very uh unwieldy in, in its expression and then even plays like Pyrawaj Pawajai I found well with deepest respect to, to the playwright and, and, and everyone who's, who's played that it is it was really playing up this trope of uh, masculine dishonor rape as an as masculine dishonor and there was no no ideological explanation of why Bangladesh was necessary, other than other than other than. Me. So uh, my my experience of post liberation, except uh, for 1972, was a gradual sense of decay and loss, 
and uh, it was this that I uh, I passed through. And uh, even when I re returned from National Bar from School of Drama, it was an amnesia that 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 we had been through. When I read uh, Shohid al Johir uh, for the first time, I think uh, just a year before, much later than all of you have done. I think it, it was in 2016 or 2015 uh, that I, I, I read because I've seen what one of his plays, Sherape Purnima Chilo, a stage on, on a put up stage, and I was deeply interested. I asked about, and then I came about this novel. When I started reading the novel, I couldn't stop. I had to read it through because it evoked those images of war it, it, it evoked very clearly those images of war and the anger and the rage and the frustration that one felt because before that so it brought to me very clearly what bangladesh was uh, and what why we had failed uh, for if you ask me what liberation war means for me or what bangladesh is in a sense it is it is it is this uh, constitution of 1972 passed by the constituent assembly on the 4th, 4th of november where you have article nine which says that uh, uh lingual and cultural uh relation of identity is as is, is is a national identity not religion article eight which establishes the principle of secularism as one of the four fundamental uh, pillars and article 12 clearly st stated the elimination of communalism in all forms so those are given uh, there and then of course you had uh, another article so article 20, uh, 38 which uh, provided that no person shall have the right to form or be a member of otherwise take part in activities of any communal or other association or union which in the name or the bias of religion has as for its object purpose a political purpose so uh, that constitution of 1972 was abrogated was lost completely lost by 1987 and by the Eighth Amendment, uh, during uh, this time of Ashad in 1988, the state religion was turned into Islam. And 1990s, late 1990s, we remember. I remember seeing this hukumat, uh, these uh, explosions happening in the, in all over Bangladesh. Early 2000, you had Bangla Bhai, and then of course you had this uh, uh, Bangla Bhai uh, coming over and trying to stage a coup, literally. Uh, and it turned Bangladesh into a, an Islamic state in, in a very, very small, tiny way, but of course it failed. But although secular uh, character of the constitution has been reinstated in the 15th Amendment, adopted in 2011, and Article 12, 8, and 25, and 38 of the constitution have been reinstated, Bangladesh is still, uh, Islam still remains uh, uh, the, uh, the religion, state religion of Bangladesh. And this is not the liberation we have fought for. This exactly is what was brought out very clearly in the phase of staging of Chapla Chapter, Chapla Square's uh, movement against what happened in the Shabbat and later in holy artism. I'm saying this because this is the this is the critical and crucial uh, political perspective that that gels so well in uh, in Shohid al Jahid's work. It is not that he is reenacting or rediscovering anything new for us. It is, it is that, it is that uh, the half forgotten facts or the amnesia that we are suffering, suffering in and the vocabulary of the language of the representation that figures an empathy in the reader and ruthlessly brings him or her face to face with the fact that we have forgotten and the Islamists are back. Now that, with that, I think another crucial factor that is key for Bangladesh is what Victor Turner calls social drama. We haven't as yet resolved and we have been really going round and round over this again uh, about this question about a national identity, whatever that means, even in this uh, this 21st century, whether this religion should play a, a key uh, factor in our national identity or Bengali culture should play a key factor in national identity. And we are still hedging that problem. We, are still, we have not uh, settled that. And till we settle that, uh, Islamists uh, do, uh, do remain there in the background. And we have not, uh, our generation or the politicians around or anybody, or even I as a teacher, we have failed to uh, bring up any, uh, uh, any any clear understanding of, of what a war is. So uh, 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 secularism was translated as a, as a, a, a neutrality in terms of religion. That is absolutely a kind of wrong kind of translation. And even perhaps the notion of secu secularism was was very very. If you, if you go to the rural areas of Bangladesh, it stands at a very distance uh, from from what it is. But Bangladesh in the rural areas, or Bangladesh all over, has never been communal. 
religion has never played really a key part in, in, in the way the, the Islamists are really trying to play a key part in. So those are the, those are the, uh, the, uh, the areas that really gel very deeply and, and etched a strong impression in Rai Bajar, this, this fire in Rai Bajar, and most prominently uh, Momina and the death of Momina. And the way, the, uh, way uh, her body is recovered from from uh, for, uh, by, by her brother and the manner described so well. You read it. You read it so well. But described so well in the novel novella too that it really very 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 art. It's so articulate but very poignant and very brief. It doesn't really wallow over. And that was so important for us and for me uh, that when I when I read it. It was, I had to do it. it. I had to do it. And as a freedom fighter, I hadn't done a, a play on, on, on liberation war because I hadn't seen any play or anything that was really worthwhile, the, uh, except, of course, uh, some novels are there. I wouldn't deny that. But uh, uh, something like Shoyd al Johir's Jivano Rajnitik Bhastavata brings up the question of Bangladesh and then the critical question of Bangladesh and its, 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 its question of identity, question of what it is so crucially that it was very important for me and for us. So I chose it and it's because it struck a very deep uh, chord in us and we, uh, in our, our group that we have, that is Sparta in Theatre, uh, Independent Theatre Collective, we decided to uh, perform it. And uh, our initial uh, analysis clearly showed that the time present of the novella was from mid-1985 to January 7th, or about January 7th of 1986. And the chronological time was from 1967 to 1986. But the novella defies linear engagement of time in its plot, and it's not chronological. Instead, it works its plot by, by, by means of continual jerking back, continuously jerking back and forth. Not so much as, a, as flashback, maybe, but by the mechanics of memory triggered by association. So we edited uh, Jevon Rajnitik Bhastavata novel in uh, just uh, under two hours of playing time. Uh, we had to, we gave up 50% of the narrative, just uh, uh, selected an edited version, which was about 50% uh, of, of the text, which, uh, uh, we, but importantly, we, we maintained the version of the plot time as in the novella. So we did not, we did not change the plot time, the narrative, uh, uh, the plot time of the narrative, the way it is, uh, way it is narrated, except uh, uh, two episodes. Uh, Mayrani's episodes. You remember Abdul Mojid's handing over to Mayrani the letters from Abdul Salim uh, uh, and uh, Muhammad Salim, and Mayrani bur burning those letters of, in front of uh, Abdul Mojid in Abdul Mojid's prison. So those two episodes are separated by another episode of 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 what happens to Momina. But so we brought those episodes together. And then, uh, uh, so uh, sequencing uh, brought them together. So uh, the sequence beginning with the rebellion breaking out in the mahalla over the chewing out, uh, uh, cheering of tulsi leaves to the recovery of Mo Mo uh, Momina's body at the Raya Bajat was staged in chronological manner. That went straight. You know, there was no break in between. All the breaks we had before because, and in the novel, there was a break in terms of uh, Mayarani. So we brought Mayarani together and then we ran the narrative to, at, the, uh, at, at a stretch uh, uh, till then. Now, the important aspect of the edited text was that we adopted for performance uh, is that um, uh, it was not a conventional play that arranges a series of scenes or acts or lines assigned against names of characters set off in colons. We had none of that sort. So all that we did was uh, our, our move was we were able to retain Johir's uh, unique language for it what we thought was it was indispensable. We had to keep that language imbued with the power to evoke the haunting memories of war. Uh, hence, our performance performance text was in effect a narrative set out very much like the novella, but the lines were rendered in the present tense instead of the past tense as in the novella. Now, there are some uh, uh, theater ex experts and uh, elderly theater practitioners in Bangladesh and scholars who found this very problematic. Some of the, one of them even said that it was like uh, reading, uh, seeing a novel being read on stage. But to them and to others, I would recommend Padda Puran, for example, a copy of, if they pick up a copy of Padda Puran, which is still performed in the indigenous theater circuit, has been performed since the 15th century, they will see that no lines are set in dialogue in Padda Puran either. The, the entire narrative is composed in rhyme metrical verse. 
Even Selim al Din's most innovative playwright of Bangladesh has followed this principle when he composed uh, Taka, except that his narrative is, uh, was in prose. And of course, you have want to make one example of a play that we did after after Shoji Jail is Tara Kane's uh, Psychosis 4.48, which also is does not follow this uh, conventional play, uh, 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 shall we say, uh, Ibsen's playmaking structure. Once the performance text was ready, I followed the directorial process, which was dialogic and, and, and very collaborative uh, because I, uh, we, we never imposed anything on, on actors, but we chose actors out of four workshops and focused uh, there. We had focused on uh, Tadashi Suzuki's Grammar of the Feet, Nairhol's Biomechanics, Yeze Gutowski's Plastics, and Stan Slavinsky's Acting Techniques. So having explained and uh, introduced our actors to these, all that we were doing during rehearsal were, 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 were to see that uh, mise en scene to creating scenes where, where, uh, where uh, living presence of, 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 uh, of, of something happening in the present moment would, would be there. So all that we were trying to do was present the narrative with the actors playing their roles, telling what they're doing or telling what they're saying in first person and telling them and acting them out also, and in places where they, where they say their roles directly in, in, in first person, they do that, but also not at times adding the narrative text to that. So all with, with all this, all that uh, we were trying to do in our performance was what the Natyashastra speaks of acting basically is. Natyashastra argues that acting is, uh, is basically a so the root ni with the preposition abhi, which means two words, the word abhinai, because it, what it means is it carries the performance towards the audience. So abhinai is carrying something, carries the text, carrying the text towards the, uh, towards the performance. You can do it in dialogue, you can do it in narrative, you can jump, sink, you can, you can do whatever like, you, you, can, you can perform an episode in, in mind, you don't have to say things in that. So, Having done that, once you do that, uh, you have a performance because you have something happening in front of the spectators. They're not reading it. They're witnessing something happening. And that happening is what we were trying to present on stage. I think I'll stop there. I have taken uh, more than 16 minutes. I'll take questions if there are or explanations if this is Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jamil Hamid. Um, may I also, I mean, I'm, I'm thank you very much when you are saying this. I mean, I, I think, your perception, your experience of taking Shahidul Jahir to stage is a service to the uh, educating the, the the collective of Bangladesh that, you know, I, 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 I need to ask you two questions, absolutely important uh, as an educator myself, uh, is, is I, I'm thinking about Augusta Boal, is a theater for the development, theater of the oppressed. I want, I want to know that when you talk about historical amnesia, when you talk about the conundrum, the conflict of understanding what is our identity? I mean, are we Bangalis or are we, you know, Muslims? You know, it, it seems like it hasn't solved. And uh, General Irshad making Islam the state religion, uh, which, which we are seeing the consequence in many, many ways right now. My question to you, Professor, that how do we, how, when you, take this Zahir's work, Zahir's work on the stage, when you see the interaction between the audience, how it is contributing their critical consciousness transformation, and why a lot of us are, I mean, when I say us, I, I'm, I'm just trying to be inclusive, is that what are some of the challenges that we're experiencing understanding Zahir's work, understanding our historical amnesia, you think? I think uh, one particular problem that we faced with the play in particular was also, you see, uh, the nationalist narrative uh, 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 and, and, uh, and the state narrative. This play runs against the state's current narrative, which would like to enshrine uh, Sheikh Mujib, whom I love, whom we all love. He, we have loved Sheikh Mujib as Sheikh Mujib in 1971. And one doesn't need to qualify Sheikh Mujib with a bongo bundu, like one doesn't need to qualify the prophet with Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all that. So I, I'd like to call the prophet the prophet and the Sheikh Mujib as Sheikh Mujib as has known him. Uh, known him. Now the problem with, uh, with we faced that I faced strictly, and there was a huge row over this, is that in a, a, a section of senior uh, performers uh, and activists in Bangladesh, they said that I was I was uh, 
ইতিহাস বিকৃত করছি আমি সো আই ওয়াজ আই ওয়াজ টার্ন হিস্ট্রি আপসাইড ডাউন এন্ড এন্ড হ্যাভ নট ডেলট উইথ হিস্ট্রি কারেক্টলি দ্যাট ওয়াজ বিকজ ওয়ান পার্টিকুলার সেকশন অফ দ্য প্লে অফ বোধু মৌলানা রিটার্নিং আই ক্যান আই ক্যান talk about that in detail but the crux of the point was point is you see what is happening what happened is that uh, shohid al jahid is not uh, uh, delivering uh, uh, awami league or the current government's narrative of of the liberation war uh, no one can no one party can own liberation war liberation war begins to the people not me it's the people of bangladesh and people of 1971 they own liberation war so it was not one person we love mujib he led us and he we, 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 it was him for, for for him that we uh, uh, he, we we wanted uh, back amidst us and it was for him when he returned on 10th january that uh, we the people of dhaka city waited for hours and sheikh mujib had to drive from tejgaon two race course uh, maidan which is less than 5 miles that is 4 miles and he I, i think he took five or uh, four or five hours to drive to 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 arrive to, to uh, this uh, the, the maidan so question of people loving mujib is of course i mean you cannot question that but to have to prove it by saying uh, no sheikh mujib is bangabandhu or to having to prove it that sheikh mujib did all right or or that liberation war is just sheikh mujib's work that is not right and that is what uh, uh, shohid al jahid does not do unfortunately and uh, that is why a uh, part of the part of our uh, intelligentsia and theory theory uh, critics they found very offensive because at, at one particular place it is said that when bodu maulana returns uh, and uh, uh, and then it is said that how could he return and that means that you know sheikh mujib had really allowed that just give me a minute i'm running low in power so what happened here was that um in uh, on uh, uh, say there was an announcement made announcement made on the 30th november 1973 that freed 26000 among 36 37000 arrested under the collaborators order who were not specifically specifically charged with uh, 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 allegations of war atrocities bodu polona was one of them one of those 26000 who managed to come back uh, after and was of course gradually rehabilitated So this part of the text that uh, that we have in uh, Shohid al Jahid runs like this. This was on the 31st December 1971. But two years later, when a general amnesty was declared and Bodu Maulana returned to Chibaja, the people of the Mahalla once again saw him wearing the grey poplin jubba. Only the smile of his face was absent. This particular passage. was hugely problematic to many people because they thought it uh, what i'm trying to say and what shoydul jahir is trying to say is that uh, there's there, there's a uh, uh, if the history has been distorted here and that sheikh mujib is responsible for a uh, people like uh, bodu maulana to return but then many people returned in in 1970 uh, of the 26000 uh, many people were uh, murdered but there was nothing to prove against them so they had slipped out so it is you know those are the areas that becomes problematic with with shohid al jahid shohid al jahid here is not taking either bnp or or awami league side so unfortunately bangladesh today is now become a, a strictly a, a monolingual state where one particular narrative is possible and uh, you are really harassed and taken up and picked up and and really killed if with the city if you're not following that uh, narrative uh, even by uh, by a simple thing like drawing up a cartoon that becomes problematic for the state and the government so that is a kind of uh, uh, state that we are living in and there jeevan rajnitik vastavata is in a very uncomfortable situation uh, thank that? you yeah thank you professor uh, jamil hamid we have a question from professor dina siddiqui is that um uh, so question for the panelists clearly islamic fundamentalism is the enemy within the novella what is the treatment of capitalism and obviously on a different note is there a recording of stage version directed by professor ahmed i do not have i have a recording but then the recording doesn't work out very well and i, I didn't i didn't think that we have time to show it but i can show you begin by showing you some some visuals and then uh, i'll take other maybe uh, that will make some sense yeah. let me share yeah. okay um so 
And the figures that you see here are the pros, really. It is, uh, it, the visual comes out very well and the costume really works very well here. And then this is the scene where Bodo Maulana having discovered that penis uh, and, and his wife. The wife is on, the, on your left and Bodo Maulana is on your right. So after that, uh, the, the penis, when the penis is discovered and Bodo Maulana is really angry. And this is the scene where, uh, where uh, the Pakistan army arrives and attacks this mahalla for the first time and uh, and there is this uh, at least seven people uh, are killed now this is uh, the scene where you have um uh not bodu molana but um khaja abdul uh, khaja ahmed ali so this is khaja ahmed ali's house before he was shot and killed and this is Mohalla Bashi, and I think it worked out very well. You see, the figures in the background are, are of course, cu are cut out figures and painted. But in front, you also have human figures. So this is Mohalla Bashi. And whenever the Mohalla Bashi made a comment or said something, we had this image or variation of this image. And this is uh, the famous scene, uh, the excerpt of which we may read at the end, uh, where uh, the uh, 52 uh, skulls are discovered. Behind, uh, beside the Christian cemetery, and this scene is uh, from 1971. April 18, military Ashe Mahallai, Khaja Ahmed Ali, Pori Bara Nihata Hai Dujon, Shay Jhanjhar Shomoy Jakhon Dinar Alo Chhilo Krishna Bordna. So uh, in these passages like this, uh, the, the the performers address directly the spectators and they speak directly to the spectators. And this is Mayarani's house. And this is Bodu Maulana's play, uh, uh, house where Bodu Maulana's son, Abul Bashan, uh, was circumcised. And this is Bodu Maulana uh, speaking uh, when uh, Ali and, uh, and, and, and his son were, were uh, after they are buried. So these are the buried figures. And for this, we just had, we took out the cutouts displayed at the back, back uh, before you saw them. Those cutouts were brought out here as a figure. Seven figures were just laid, laid down over there. And this is Bodu Maulana. And this is Momena, the moment before she was discovered at her home. This is uh, when the actors carry Momena and hide her. You remember, there's a place where, where she's hidden. And this is where Momena is carried off by the Razakars. This is such a painful scene where Momena pushes her brother away, assuring her, him that I will return. This only an elder sister can do to a younger brother. And this is uh, uh, Momena's brother, Abdul Majid, returning with Momena's dead body. And this is the last scene. Now, Zohir does not play up this uh, scene at the end, or the prose again at the end. But we brought the prose back at the end and uh, uh, to, to emphasize the point that at the end. That's it. Thank you. Um, now, let, let me come out of this. Uh, sir, you're already, the presentation is already you know, taken off. Right. So, uh, right. if, you, so if, you're, if we're addressing uh, Dr. Siddiqui's question is that it, it, in overall, the, 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 the stage, you know, how 1971 and subsequent 1971 unfolded, particularly, it seems that we are having to deal with um, a scenario where uh, the Islamic fundamentalism seems to play out in our identity, which is fueling a lot of the conflicts. So how do you see in all of this uh, overall scenario, capitalism playing out here, sir? Well, um, 2020, it's uh, new liberalism. So capitalism is in another form. But 1971 onwards, I think, well, Bangladesh was created for the capitalists. <laughs> it was created for those uh, thousand uh, uh, koti poti, uh, uh, crore potis that we have, or more. 
uh, the billionaires that we have in Bangladesh now. And it was because of Bangladesh that people like me, we could, uh, we could, we could join the university. Maybe. So it is the middle class, upper middle class, upper class that benefited. And Bangladesh, I think very, very clearly was created because uh, the capital of the Bengalis could not really flourish before 1971. It was completely controlled by the West Pakistani capitalists. So to, for capital of, the, of, of this, whatever mercantile capital that we have, for that to flourish and that to really grow, we needed Bangladesh. But then we have, uh, we have, we still have very limited resources. Now, whenever resources are limited, uh, one way of capitalizing on and cashing on and, and getting public support, people to support you, is of course a uh, religious sentiment. The same thing is happening in India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh. That you play the national, uh, the religious card, and to uh, to show that you know Bangladesh belongs to the Muslims and no others. And then again, India, India belongs to the Hindus and no others. So the minorities are pushed out. The so-called numeral minorities are pushed out, and the, and the majority tries to uh, stake a claim on the little resources that we have. And that is what happened basically, I think, from seventy-five onwards. But now, later on, but now, and of course now, what you what you're seeing is uh, our little titles, uh, the title that we have uh, had, and that competing with, uh, of course, uh, 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 the the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the glo globalized uh, world and the huge capital uh, around the, the whole market. So our capital is really secondary or tertiary, supplying to that global capital, and hopefully someday maybe these these will also rise so finally yes this is a matter of uh, a capital trying to get a hold and that is why bangladesh was necessary in the first place unfortunately thank you professor ahmed i mean absolutely i mean i couldn't agree more with you that the dialectical social reality there has to be always a conflict and obviously religion has played a fantastic role and very successful might I add that it's not very different in Canada where I live, you know, I mean, in Canada, if you see the rise of Islamophobia, if you see in America, you know, how the, uh, the, the division and how it is happening. And unfortunately, it's almost painfully, uh, might I add that I don't know what, what to do is that we are colossally failing the critical consciousness. When I read Zahir, I haven't seen 71, but I moved to tears understanding what might be. There is a particular scene where um, Abdul Mujid feels furious because his sister is insulted. That, you know, where, where, where did he, why did she go? Yeah. Gisila. And, and then he wants to become a thug that I want to protect my sister. And then he does well in the exam and he cannot become any longer that, you know, thug that he wants to become. When I was reading it, I was thinking, oh my God, the ability to protect project a social reality with such nuances, such layered reality. I mean, I mean, who cannot really relate to that? I mean, I come from a village and I mean, that was very moving for me. Sir, and at, at the mean, same time, at the same time, you remember Momina mm -hmm. also telling him that you cannot smoke, you know, I mean, like you smoking. So it is, it is, a, it is a sister who is really uh, chiding the younger brother not to do that. And that same sister again, you know, when, when, when this younger brother urinates, when he's terrified in 71 and that is the, those are the words used over there. So magnificent. I mean, the relationship that you have with your with with with, with, with the brother and the sister's relationship that's 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 wonderful. That that really gels up. That really evokes a lot of memories too, and and clear, clarifies how Bengali families in Bangladesh really are in the cities really work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and sir, one, one last comment that I would like to, you know, please may make a comment on that, that the scene where uh, Abdul Mojid overwhelmed by the emotions, you know, when he hugs his wife, you know, is thinking, but still, you know, the, 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 the gondho, bone gondho. could you speak to that? Where have we lost that? You know, why, you know, today in 2021, that a lot of Bengali men, you know, when a, we are somehow consumed by toxic masculinity, that we, you know, objectify, victimize, you know, what has happened? What's happening to us? I think uh, masculinity is deeply um, um, uh, and, 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 and distressed by, um, and deeply challenged. I think, I think we, are, we are scared of facing the fact that we may not be, you know, those virulent males who can live up to uh, challenge 
and bring the hell down and turn the world over and stuff like that. And we forget that uh, world moves and revolutions happen perhaps in those bits and pieces, in those small uh, little events and not those huge masculine events. I think we are trying to be too much. I mean, uh, maybe this is our families too and our universities, our schools and our society. We try to live up to our masculinity, which is very virile and which is very um, male in certain ways. But unfortunately, we are none of that. We have, we have never been. We have never been like, say, Afghans. Afghans may be something like that. I'm not very sure. But we don't have to be like that. And what I, what I take huge pride in the, is in the fact that uh, Bengalis can bend, bend like bamboo, and not break. So if you remember that, then we can overcome thousands of storms and, and not be bothered by who calls us males and who don't. And we don't have to prove our masculinity to anybody, for heaven's sake. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter if I'm not a male enough. It's all right. But as long as I'm a human being. So I think those issues, those things need to be very, uh, uh, I mean, that education, if, if that is education, that has to be embedded in the family. And our families are failing bitterly, I think, and the way the children are brought up and the way religion now plays very heavily into the way the families bring up their children, you know. And so, and so this is what boys can do and this is what girls can do and those things have, we have not broken up from that. And so, and, and it now has been made a very strictly uh, hegemonic and uh, masculinist narrative all over, unfortunately. So, and that yeah. has not been to anybody's benefit. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Jamil Ahmed. It's an absolute treat to listen to you. And, you know, and this, this, these conversations are incredibly important for Bangladeshis, Bengalis, uh, particularly, you know, I identify myself as a Bengali, <laughs> first and foremost, unapologetically. Um, but, you know, the, the tension that exists, you know, and, and obviously, if you live in a, a very um, a cosmopolitan place like Toronto, uh, you see the tension of the identity that are you a Bengali, are you a Bangladesh, and all of that playing out. Uh, I will now move to uh, uh, Sharoza and uh, Ramada, is that you have taken on such a mammoth task of translating such a rich uh, 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 text, uh, literary work. Let us go into your experience of translating that work and you know how has it been? Starting with Sharoza, probably. Um, okay. So, um, so um, co-translating, I so uh, I met Ramada on Facebook, and uh, he reached out to me, and then he we he proposed me to co-translate this book. Um, I first I watched the stage play directed by Saeed Jamil Ahmed, and that was the first time when I came across this book, and I was deeply moved by it, and I. That, that was the moment when I felt this urge that I really got to translate this book. But then I got into my other works, uh, my graduate related works. Um, and then after a couple of months, uh, I got to learn that Ramada got the translation rights and it was okay for me because I knew that I was a newcomer to this translation field. And I was happy that Ramada, who is a very conscientious translator is going to be uh, going to do a very good work now then we met on facebook and then uh, as things transpired we got to work together and the overall co-translating translating uh this book was an experience of was an, a very enriching experience for me it was an experience of teamwork compatibility mentorship and friendship because as I say that I was an aspiring translator and I was more like an apprentice to Ramada as he honed my understanding of translation further. Before this translation venture, I translated a novella by Anwar Sudhaq into English and a children's book by Bangla. And back then, my emphasis had always been on transferring the idea, the poetic, the, the music in the text rather than word for word translation. But, but a postmodernist text 
directs one's attention to the word because every word is meticulously put there, precisely arranged and um, very integral to the telling, which, which leaves the, the translator with little scope to exercise their freedom, the little that we have. In this case, Ramada was fiercely faithful to the original and we trans uh, we drafted and edited Jibono Rajnitik Bastabada many times over um, on on Google Meet and in real life. And during our the process, we tried to zero in on on maintaining the composition of the long and winding sentences, the repetitions that are used in the text as literary devices. Now, with this repetitive and cyclical narrative of of Jibono Rajnitik Bastabata, through which one can say that Zahir tries to break the usual conventions of storytelling. This reminds me of Samuel Beckett's Murphy, where he also uses repeti repetition. And, and uh, you know, he says the same thing in a loop. And in, this, in that uh, instance, one can even accuse Murphy, as well as Jibono Rajnitik Bastabata as, um, as uh, trying to over-explain the same thing. But I think that that's just one of the traits of modernist and postmodernist tales, if I am allowed to label it. So when I was doing, when I was working with Ramadan, we were co-translating it. We repeatedly was... Um, was we repeatedly encountered these repetitions and the way that we rendered those things in the text. We wanted to be like Ramada, fiercely faithful to the text. So that was a very, um, you know, enriching experience. Um, now I want to say a little bit uh, about untranslatability that um, Mr. Iqbal Hasnu has said. Um, I think as a co-translator, I. That was one of my experiences. Um, for example, Jibon um, Rajundik Bastabada uses uh, dialects, Puran Dhaka dialects. And we all know the dialects are deeply rooted. They are very personal. They are geographically bound. And to render such orality into English while remaining true to the flavors of Puran Dhaka is difficult to pull off. So I think to reconcile these complexities and conflicts, uh, what Ramadan and I did was we kept the original uh, in transliteration, in dialogue, along with the English translation. That was one of the few uh, liberties that we allowed ourselves. So, um, so overall, um, I think, yes. Sorry, sorry, Sharuz. I, I, I want to ask us to think together, and I, I also uh, uh, would like to present this to the entire panelists. Um, I particularly think about you know, what you have identified, the challenge of actually uh, translating the context in text is monumentally challenging. There's no doubt about it. Now, I want to understand uh, that how to think about translation even more critically. Now, uh, the Roman Emperor Charlemagne, you know, said that to be able to speak in a different language is almost to have a different soul because you have the ability. At the same time, I want to bring in Edward Du Bois, who has unapologetically talked about double consciousness. What does it mean to be a subaltern? What does it mean to be a marginalized group and carry that consciousness of that particular social from the margin, particularly, right? And then, then you have people like Ingugi who denies to write in a colonial language. And particularly, he talks about, the, why did they put me in jail for writing in English? We need to understand that the colonial history, that in you know, what happened, and it's integral connectivity with knowledge production, language, translation, and all of that. Now, putting all of this together, translating one context into text is almost merely impossible. But when you are translating the work, you being growing up and having a very intimate understanding. Could you tell us that, how were you political in your translation work? And I would also request my other panelists, you know, uh, the panelists here to actually comment on that. The political act of translation. So, um, <coughs> the, Ramada, do you want to pick that question or do you want me to go along? 
No, you, 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 I'd like you to venture an answer. Okay. So, um, so, well, when you talk about political, uh, it also, it reminds me of, um, of uh, Sharkar's Hassan al Jayed's note, where he mentions Frederick Jameson's um, national allegory. And I want to tie this question to that. Now, um, now in Jibonu Rajudik Bastaboda, we can see that um, on the one hand, the Zahir, he, he lets the reader to delve into the mental landscape of the protagonist. He focuses so much on, on, this, uh, on the protagonist, Abdul Majid. But at the same time, we can see that the narrative pulsates with the voice of the community. That's where the idea of subaltern comes. That there, there is this national consciousness that are going on in the background as well as in the foreground as the, as the narrative goes back and forth. Because as uh, Professor Jamil Ahmed said that this is not really chronological. I think here, uh, the personal becomes political because we can see that in Jamil Ahmed's case that he is personally facing these things. His sister, his entire family is uh, experiencing this tragedy, but it's also a collective strategy. That's what's happening in the, in the community. So yeah, that's what I have to say about this. Can I, can I interject? Uh, from my yeah. side, all I'd like to say... Yes, 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 yes please, please. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. No, I see. I, th I, th I thought that the Rama wanted to follow up with... The, then I will interject, okay? Go ahead. Jeez, Rama. Jeez, Ramada, Ramada, if you can leave. Uh, Rama, the mic take unmute Kurt Habe. You know, this whole Zahid project of mine and then my collaboration with uh, Sharoza is all thanks to Iqbal Hasnu. So, out of gratitude, you know, uh, the, the books when they are published, I have decided to dedicate it to him, but for him it wouldn't have happened. So the uh, commemorative volume is coming out uh, from Dhaka via Shanghoti publishers. Uh, so that has uh, the novella and uh, Professor uh, Hassan al Zaid's uh, essay and uh, Professor Jamil Ahmad's essay and two brief notes by Sharoza and me. And it will also later be published by Harper Collins in India. And we're hoping for publication internationally also in this uh, 50, 50th year of Bangladesh. So it's truly a, a profound and serendipitous and magical uh, connection. Uh, I got connected to Iqbal Bhai. And uh, he sent me the book. And then I got to reading it, and then I was transfixed the moment I read it. I think the first story I read was Kothai uh, Pabo Tare. And uh, it just hooked me immediately. And uh, as a lover of literature, uh, and having read whatever I could, uh, most all in English and translation from other parts of the world. There were so many writers uh, that I had read uh, who came to mind while reading Zahir, like Jose Saramago, for instance, or uh, R.K. Narayan, or Isaac Bashevis Singer. But uh, those uh, naming those names uh, would suggest a kind of comparison or something. But 
whereas uh, Shoydul Jahir is, is original and unique uh, and his language and writing is, is an outgrowth of the soil of Bangladesh, you know, of the people and the culture and the language. And, and I would also like to say religion, where religion is part of culture. It's like I was explaining to my son, I never <clears throat> tire of talking to him about uh, Bangladesh and West Bengal in comparison and history and what might have been and our shared heritage and our split heritage. Uh, religion has become a different entity in the lives of common people compared to what it was. It, it was part of their body, you know, to like the uh, skin on your body, uh, it's you. Uh, whether you're Hindu or Muslim and you live together. So, Shoydul Jahid is an outgrowth of the soil of uh, Bangladesh. But the most important thing was, of course, the uh, collaboration. Uh, and uh, I needed to bring the work out quickly uh, for the 50th year. Uh, and I was feeling uh, dejected, uh, at a loss to be able to do it by myself. So I thought I should collaborate with somebody. And it was a point in my translation career when I thought I'm done with working alone. In the interest of translation, I should work with others. And so this was a great inauguration of, of that uh, decision uh, because uh, we did a great amount of work together. We first met in Dhaka and worked uh, for a week sitting on a table and Sharuza was reading and I was translating. And then from September of last year, we worked uh, continuously on and on and on and on, revisiting the same text minutely with a microscope, rediscovering uh, you know, points and ambiguities and so on. So the political, we discussed the political so many times, uh, Sharoza and me. What does he mean? Uh, could it mean this? Could it mean that? Uh, how can we uh, make the English uh, convey as as the Bangla does? How can we convey what he meant? So first we have to understand what he meant. And the only clue for that is in his words. You know? So uh, we discussed this a lot and revisited politics and history. Uh, Iqbal uh, Asnu, uh, introduced me to the name of uh, Shahidul Zahir. And then uh, I asked him to recommend uh, the stories that should be translated. My next uh, Zahir volume will be his short story. So he listed the stories that should be translated. And then when I asked him uh, who should write a critical essay on the novel, he did his own thinking. And then he suggested to me that Professor Hassan Al Zayed. So see, Iqbal Hasnu's presence is writ so large on this work, you know, in my consciousness. So that is why I have uh, dedicated it to him, and I'd like to use this occasion to express my deepest uh, thanks to him. Uh, Mr. Iqbal Hasnu. You wanted to? Uh, could you? <laughs> Yes, I'd like to interject about this. Uh, you brought up a very important question about the politics of the so like to elaborate on. Uh, as you, you well, I think in experience as I live in Canada, which is a bilingual official country, and we are highly hit by, by the English cultural uh, I mean, preference that that uh, so, um, as I mentioned earlier, that because of our colonial history and legacy, that uh, the people of the subcontinent, our our understanding and our worldview is by and large shaped by the Anglo world and Anglo sphere, and even the literary terms and the devices or the techniques and the, the art and culture, we uh, try to adopt to analyze our own literature, own art and culture, 
terms and the reference uh, uh, and the reference we unquestionably and critically those terms by termed through English and even the theorization uh, through English. But unfortunately, what I have found that living in this country for almost more than 35 years and working in the media and also the bookstore, I found out that there, uh, their world, their, their worldview is very one-sided and it's very uh, myopic. Uh, and whenever they pick up the translations of the world literature, is not because of those works literary merits, but because of some connections and other things, which go hand in hand with the prevailing uh, capitalist uh, dominance. They, uh, they actually. So politics of translation, I would like to mention that, that until and unless the translators are well versed into the original language, uh, then I think there will be always shortcomings. If it is, uh, for example, I just want to give in one example. Tolstoy's, uh, Dostoevsky's war, uh, Crime and Punishment. Fortunately, I was reading first the Penguin translations, whatever the English translations. Then I drop it and then I, since, uh, after I came across a Bengali translation by Orun Shom, who translated originally from Russian to Bengali. The Orun Shom was one of the pioneer Bengali translators of the Russian classics in Bengali. But, and I found out for surprise, then I called Orun Shom and said, why there is no chapters? Then he told me that this is our, the completely distortion by the English translators. The first translator, there was no chapters at all in the Dostoevsky Crime and Punishment. It was written in a different kind of language, different kind of narrative style, that it is a, without any kind of breaks, without any kind of paragraphs. So I was, and then he adopted the same technique and corresponding it to the Bengali language. So it is my, uh, what I would like to mention here is that although we are translating Shohidul Johir into in English, which is, uh, I mean, thanks to Ramasamy and Nareen, but still I think that maybe other languages other than English and more European languages or other languages, if they are well versed in Bangla, learn Bangla well, could do a better service to capture the oral quality of local dialects in the in the which actually Shohidun mastered and used as a linguistic device for his works. That was my point. We're not hearing anything. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I did, I did yeah. not unmute myself. Yeah. May I ask a very specific question to Professor yeah. Jamil Ahmed, particularly because uh, the um, experience of seeing 1971, also taking the work of Shohitul Johir on the stage, is that we do know uh, that you know the work of translation is not apolitical, they're political. But also a lot of the work of 1971, um, I grew up hearing a lot of the narratives from the margin, from the villages of Bangladesh, from my uncles and you know uh, who have participated in war. Um, recently, I have had a chance to talk to, uh, talk to uh, Dr. Shazia Rahman, who has dedicated a chapter in her book uh, that is, uh, uh, so the book talks about the literary presentation of 1971. And at one point it touched on is that 
uh, how Bangladesh's work of 1971 touches on different kinds of violences, also, you know, uh, raping, plundering of women. But it fails to address the fact that uh, West Pakistani militaries not only raped Bengali women, it also raped Bengali men. It emasculated us. Now, that is the point beside. My point is that when you take your work to stage, uh, when you think about our history critically, and you have very brilliantly pointed out that we are going through a time where seems like one particular narrative is becoming more dominant and multiple narratives, multiplicities of perspectives are not really welcome. How do you embody, how do you exercise the subaltern view, the marginalized view, how do you take it to the stage, to your writing, to your activism, to your teaching, or to your theater? <laughs> well, of course, the famous question, can the subaltern speak? And uh, can the subaltern speak by me, by me or through me, etc.? I'm not very sure I, I know, because I unabashedly acknowledge that I was brought up in the city. I grew up in a, in a very middle class environment, and uh, the Bangladesh that I've known was 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 uh, through uh, my research, PhD research, theater work, and uh, and and other uh, applied theater work. Uh, so uh, I've lived there. I've seen the performances. I've lived, I've listened to the stories, and all that. But having said that, how do you do it? Because represent it is always a representation. So it'll. I'll, I'll never I'll never be able to erase my subject position, my history, and all the strands of memories that I carry with me. And so whatever I present on stage will definitely be a rep not mine, mine alone, of course, but the groups or, or the people that we work together, our representation. And if the director, of course, molds, and of course, the director has a very powerful voice in that too. So it is a representation, and that representation I wonder how it can ever be. So, but you know what? 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 A point that I have always taken about Rabindranath, and I would rather call him Rabindranath than just Rabindranath Thakur. So, the point that I've taken with Rabindranath was that his plays fail to do this. His, play, his plays, very typical plays, mind you, not the not the songs, not the not the poems. His plays, the the, the language that he uses in his plays are very uh, very. Uh, um, monolithic uh, there is hardly any polyphony there is hardly any multiplicity uh, the characters are very flat and they appear to speak in the same kind of rhythm which i don't know i suspect is uh, for the kind of rhythm that uh, that rabindranath was brought up in or felt comfortable in uh, so there uh, and I'm, I'm heavily criticized because of this view and i think rabindranath's plays are also very weak uh, compared to uh, Say our, our traditional place, the Monash Mongol, for example, or, or other 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 places. So uh, uh, there, I see a, a huge challenge. So Rabindranath does not do that. But what I found about about Shohidil Johir is that is that he is, and there is no doubt about it. He is not uh, speaking as a subaltern. Uh, his his inflection, the way he his language is really repeating and going roundabout, and then way he is self reflexive. All those things bring about a very critical consciousness, uh, which you would not, perhaps, I have not heard in uh, Dhaka Ya Mahalla, in uh, Lokhi Bajar or, 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 or any other places like that, or even the, when you converse with people. So I don't know. Uh, I'm always at a challenge too, and uh, and uh, to make sure that, uh, that the, 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 the scene that you're talking of doing is very alive. And to do that, I would, I would I would go to for this play. We of course we visited all the mohallas and the localities that the play speaks about. Not Jinjira, we could because it's pointless going to you know across Buri Ganga Jinjira is not what Jinjira was. But when you listen to uh, these people and all that, uh, uh, and when when somebody writes about it in a novel and then one does it, these are representations. And can you really ever ever do that? Can you can you? Hear the rain, and can you can you really hear the rain and put the rain drops on stage or in your writing? I mean, you know what I mean is finally um, uh, even even the even the traditional theater forms in the indigenous theater forms that we have, the language is not subaltern language. Uh, Bijay Gupto, his 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 
his his his poetry is very much infused with with whatever that you'd have with you know literary style of his of his time. So, but then it communicates and it communicates very heavily because of the characters there, and also very importantly during performances, what the guys, what the narrators do is that they explicate the text. I wish you, I, I mean. Having read Rancier, I would rather not use the word explicate, but they translate, if, if, if that's the right word, they make sense of the word in, in daily life language that they have. So what you have is they sing the language of Vijay Gupta, say in Padda Puran, or any other narrative that you have, which is very, which is kind of literature, which is literature taught in, uh, in, in, in the Bangla department. But then uh, when, when it is rendered on stage, because of the music, because of the way they're dancing or because they're where they're rendering, it makes sense. Even if they're not following, even if you're not, you know, follow, I mean, I mean the, your subaltern spectators. Uh, and what happens on top of that is the spectator and, and the narrator, he is not trying to, again, copy their language, but he's, again, trying to explain the text in, in daily life language, uh, which is, again, not literary, not, 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 not even their kind of colloquial language. So what happens in Sri Al Johir is something that I have not found much in Bangla theatre, frankly, in theatre that you see in Kolkata or, or even theatre that you see in Dhaka. It's very, it's very, um, very uh, middle class and with hardly, perhaps, I wouldn't, I, would, I really would not dare to say much, perhaps, maybe these playwrights have, but not much of lived experience of the people they're talking about. It's like, it's like, um, it's like our um, Badal Shorkar once comments about, you know, uh, when, when these middle class Bhadralok, when they travel in train and look out the windows and look out at the, at the Dhankhet and, and the paddy field, rice fields, and they cook up their poems. So it is like that. So much of our, our middle class literary venture, the language that we use, is based on our experience. And somehow, what Shohid al Johid does is that. He, he doesn't abandon his class. It doesn't abandon his background. But then the way he, the way he brings up Mahalla Bashi and the bits and pieces of sentences, like the sentences that you have in uh, in, in the excerpts that perhaps we'll be will be doing in uh, say Halar Hijdar about Muslim money. This is this is a word that uh, our uh, uh, Abdul Ghani's mouth. It comes out of Abdul Ghani's mouth, but it is it is uh, it, it, it is about Ismail Ismail Hajan. So halar hijra about musulman. But those bits and pieces, they just bring out so vividly uh, the language of, 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 can I say subaltern? I don't know. Uh, I'm not very sure because I'm always hesitant and I would never claim to uh, be able to repre represent because I represent, I represent, I cannot but represent my history and the way I look and the sea. I can, all that I can try to be is be very particular and see that you know the cutting edge of that language is there, like halal hijra rabar musalmani. So how do you say that bit to make it make sense of it and to make it alive and to 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 cut it across your sensibility? Perhaps it's 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 a, it's a journey. It's a struggle with yourself that 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 never ends. Perhaps or perhaps I'm too much of an <laughs> urban uh, middle class uh, theater practitioner to ever be able to uh, to go out of that perhaps unfortunately i mean i mean you reminded me of you know barger's ways of seeing that you know <laughs> what helps us to see what we see now the question i know uh, sharoza and i were talking briefly that you know sharoza's uh, graduate uh, thesis topic <laughs> is also on shaitul zahir's work and i wish her all the good luck in the world uh, i i want to ask to reflect recently i have finished reading um, babu bangladesh and uh, it was telling me is that uh, asking myself, I'm asking myself this question, is that in times, I mean, again, I'm going to quote George Orwell, that in times of universal deceit, telling the truth is an, you know, is an act, is a revolutionary act when in, in times of you know, universal uh, uh, deceit. Now, uh, I want to ask uh, particularly uh, Professor Jamil Ahmed and Sharoza, is that do you think is that at different times in history when the regimes or the structure that we lived has been very repressive, very, it was choking us to not to tell the truth. Uh, again, you know, the idea of knowledge and power. 
the poets or the writers, they have somehow used the semantics to dodge the glaring eyes of the rulers to tell the narrative which needed to be told. Now, when we see the postmodern bent of telling stories, whether it is um, uh, uh, Babu Bangladesh, Babu Bangladesh tells a story, at least in my humble opinion, is that I'm not sure that without a resorting to magic realism, <laughs> can you say those things and stay unscathed? Because it doesn't seem to spare the history uh, addressing. Do you think is that postmodern ways of telling a narrative is sort of the writers are resorting to a means of telling the story, you know, somehow protecting themselves from the glares of rulers. Would you like to take that, Shadows, and I can follow you? Or... OK, um, I think um, in postmodernism, in postmodernist texts, what um, what allows the author is that they can choose to take an unreliable narrator through which they can tell their tale. And they can even sometimes, like Zahir has done, that they can even rely on uh, introducing elements of the fantastic or magical elements, so to speak. That way, they can play around with um, representing their reality in an alternative way. And at the same time, they can even tell the truth and by saving themselves as well. But in, in this case, I think that Zahir was also very direct in his stance. And um, I don't know how political it was, but I think that he, what he tried to do was he was telling us the truth. Like Professor Jamil Ahmed said that when the section about general amnesty appeared and he was really vocal about it he said what actually he had seen maybe or heard by someone heard from someone that bodu maulana appeared some people slipped uh from justice or maybe because uh, it was really nuanced because for some other obvious reasons so yeah i i don't think that they sometimes they i don't think that postmodernist authors try to shield themselves by uh with their alternative mode of representation, but that is the way of telling the truth. Thank you. Thank you, Narin. Well, um, <clears throat> yes, I agree with you. And I don't think there's, there's any kind of shielding. And uh, for example, I'll take uh, uh, Sarah Kane's 4.4 Psychosis, uh, which is a play we did uh, recently, uh, end of last year. And this is absolutely a post-dramatic text. There's no narrative. And uh, it, has, it has even no characters. So, uh, uh, but it, it speaks of, 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 of it speaks against violence of various various sorts. And and this is uh, this is an unst really that is really vibrating with the protest against all the kind of all all the various forms of violence that one sees around one's life. And uh, what we did was that with the text we projected images. So uh, we projected images in one particular scene. We projected images of Obijit and all others who were killed in Bangladesh. So this is a visual way of, of telling, of, of you know, uh, showing what the text is. The text just says RSVP, which in Bangla we had translated as a muhurte jawabde. So uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this character repeatedly uh, runs from upstage straight down to the spectators and says, with this line run straight to the spectators and at the very last moment she, she is caught and pushed back again and continuously at the back there are images of, of the women killed burned men killed burned including Obijit and all other bloggers those images are continuously projected in the background and and this is this keeps happening and uh, very clearly we were bringing out and we brought out uh, an aspect of Bangladesh that are that is not really spoken of much. So uh, I th I think I think you know uh, you need to uh, relate to the reality around you, and that is why I th I think uh, personally as a Bangladesh as as a, as a, as a, as a theater director, having passed up from National School of Drama and then trained in, at the University of Warwick, I never thought I could work anywhere but but, but Bangladesh because this is a country I know. This is the country I was born in, and this is the country also because I was born in here, I can speak out very blatantly what I think, 
and at least hope or even I know how to, you know, run uh, through alleys and save myself and save my skin. It's not that I always have to uh, speak up upfront. So I know this history and I know the people, I know the language, I know the nuances. It is nowhere but here that I can speak. And how can you but live without speaking? I mean, it doesn't make sense. Then what are you doing? And and how how can you how can you do a player? How can you do a piece of work without without making sense and making a, a cutting edge statement, something that reaps to your uh, sensibility or your heart or your or your, or your senses, you know, something that that burns something inside you. If it does not, then it's pointless. It's just no point. I mean, one could just sleep and not not do do theater or not not write. So I don't think a post-dramatic, post-modern theater practitioners are doing that, they're trying to hedge. I think very clearly uh, this notion of a meta-narrative is missing. So you don't have Ibsen you know, coming out and having a very clear statement about a doll's house and a woman going out and you know, saving. So those that narrative, uh, that, that, that clear uh, exposition, uh, uh, building of climax and, and a resolution and a very clear-cut, cohesive narrative, unified narrative, that uh, 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 trust in a unified, cohesive narrative is gone. And I think it is, it is more relevant now to speak not in terms of one unified, cohesive narrative, but multiple languages, multiple voices, and, and, and multiple streams of, uh, of, of narratives. So you don't have, uh, have a linear development and a linear plot. And uh, one can speak very evocatively and clearly if one wants to. And finally, I think I think one is, I mean, why be an, try to be, I don't know if I'm an artist, but why try to why, double in art, why create art if you can't dare? Or you could rather sleep or you could, you, you could go do some business in Bangladesh and you could become a, a millionaire and it's quite easy <laughs> in certain ways. So um, no, I think, I think, uh, finally, uh, it's also perhaps the peak of existentialism. It, this is makes this is what makes sense of your life. This is what makes sense of what I'm, what I am, or hopefully, even if that is a kind of uh, 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 magnificent um, lie that I created on myself. Well, that's a glorified lie, and as long as I think I'm I'm cutting kind of uh, cutting edge or something or or, or or denting somewhere, making some kind of dent, hopefully you know, that makes uh, my life worthwhile. That's all. Uh, with permission of uh, Firoz, can I? Yes, yes, uh, please. Have yes, yes. Yes, Mr. Anka. Sir Jamil Ahmed. Okay, I would like to place this question to Professor Jamil Ahmed and Sharuz and Nareen. But before that, I would like to read out a paragraph which I wrote in uh, <clears throat> 2008 uh, uh, after. Uh, so it was that. But this is a, uh, I'm just reading it uh, from a, my article about Shoydul's short stories. So I will read it in Bangla because what I'd like to mention, and then I will ask the question. Shahitir Bichar Bishleshon, Idani, Europe, America, Udhuto, Notun Notun, Shamalachona, Tottir, Nirbikar, Bebohare, Jekhane, Srijan, Hinotai, Krishto, Shekhane, Shohidulir Moto, Lakoke, Lakoke, অজাচিতভাবে বিশেষ তকময় বন্দি হয়ে পড়ার ফাঁদে পড়তে হয় তার অকাল মৃত্যুত্তর আলোচনা সমালোচনায় এই প্রবণতা দুর্লভ নয় যে লেখক তার প্রথম উপন্যাসের নামকরণে কোনো আড়াল আবডাল ছাড়াই নিরেট গাত্মিক বাস্তবতাকে জীবন রাজনৈতিক বাস্তবতা যা করে দেন তাকে পূর্ব নির্দিষ্ট কোনো তত্ত্ব ও রীতি বাংলাদেশী প্রতিভু বললে তার রচনার প্রতি সুবিচার হয় না শহীদুলের রচনা সেই জাতে যা দাবি করে আপন ঐতিহ্যের আলোকে সুখীয় তত্ত্ব নির্মাণ এবং অভ্যস্ত পাঠ ছেড়ে নতুন পাঠে আয়োজন সো মাই কোয়েশ্চেন অ্যাবাউট মাই দিস ইস দ্যাট সিন্স প্রফেসর সৈয়দ জামিল আহমেদ ওয়াজ ওয়ান্স আ ভেরি ক্লোজলি কোলাবোরেটিং উইথ সেলিম আলদিন the famous playwright of Dhaka Theatre. I think that Selim Aldin and Rashidin Isabachu adopted a new term for their acting, uh, the role of acting. And they, I think they have used a terminology which is completely 
their own coinage, what they felt that it is uh, emerged from our soil, as Ramasamy mentioned. So my question is that whether uh, Shahidul Jahid's own literary technique device demands a new kind of theory of our own, a literary theory. Let me take it, Shadows, and That's then you can go. Okay, sure. Um, uh, I'll, 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 I'll venture from uh, Salim al Din and I'll venture from uh, Nasir al Yusuf. I've been close with them, and uh, since 1974, I have known Salim al Din, and I've also been a member of Taka Theater. I directed Taka uh, uh, and uh, the narrative style of performance that you speak of and that you refer to, which is very Bengali, you say. Now, unfortunately, the Bengali narrative style that you refer to. Salim al Din, Nasiruddin Yusuf, Jamil Ahmed himself, it is not typically totally Bengali. There is nothing typically totally Bengali as such. Because fi finally, firstly, what is Bangladesh and which Bangladesh are you referring to? Now, the acting style that was followed even in Chaka and other places, this narrative style, that, I mean, if I may say so, I was the first one to do Chaka in Dhaka in Bangladesh. Salim al Din's play was rejected. And, and and no one could if he couldn't find anyone to do it and then i did it abroad in, in, in uh, america and came back and did it here and then here when i did it here i was following a principle that uh, uh san francisco mind troop followed in their narrative app, uh, performance which they also gathered so you see the narrative style of performing or acting is 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 really a heterogeneous term which borrows from multiple sources and is not typically bangladesh Typically Bangladeshi, we claim it is typically Bangladeshi, or the claim was made because of, uh, of uh, Manusha Mongol and the performances of based in Manusha Mongol, which is in the narrative. And my PhD thesis is on that. I've, I've, um, but more than that, let's not bring in the PhD thesis. I've been to the fields, I've seen the performances, I've read of the performances, I've interviewed them, I've talked to them. So I know very, very, very well how these performances are devised. Now, you'll find a very uh, similarity of this performance with a lot of other performances in India. Now, would that make us less Bengali? Or would that make Paddapuran less a Bangladeshi performance? And at, uh, when on, in a debate with Salim al Din at one point, I finally asked him then, what is Bangladeshi really in our performances and in the tradition that we have? He was finally, you know, he finally was forced to say that it is just a narrative. It is a philosophy in the narrative because ultimately the performance style, the way you perform, it is there, has been there all over South Asia, uh, this narrative performance style. And it is in various forms and blends. And it, you'll find that in Natya Shastra and you'll find that also in that Upa Rupaka tradition of the Natya Shastra. And there you find of Gaya Rupaka, which is sung narrative. And the sung narrative is there in many other parts of Asia too. But uh, there, there are of course variations. So secondly, I think to be a Bangladeshi is not, you know, it, it, is, it is not the color of my skin or to speak Bangla. To be a Bangladeshi is a lot of things. It is also a heterogeneous thing. And where I am a Bangladeshi or not a Bangladeshi in my theater work or otherwise, it's a very difficult question. And that can that that really needs to evolve. But but, but since you're talking of Shahidul Jahid, whether we need a specifically uh, a, a distinct, uh, a star, a distinct critical tool uh, for, for Jahid. Now, I think every, it is not only, uh, you know, Shakespeare, it's not only uh, uh, some, some Greek playwright or French playwright like Moliere. Each play or each literary work demands a, it's a separate uh, a critical tool. No literary work, even by the same author, will be exactly the same. And no tragedy, even Western tragedy, are the same. So you know, even within tragedies, there are, there are variations and differences. So all that I'm trying to say is West where is our West and where is the margin of our West? Is it really the orientalized West? And that is Suez Canal and the Ural Mountains and beyond and across. You'll find that even in, in, in Saudi Arabia and in the Middle East, there are certain aspects of performance which are borrowed heavily from the West or which are borrowed heavily from the East. So Khayal Azil, for example, and the, and the, and the, and the, and this uh, puppet theater, shadow puppet theater performances that they have, that was borrowed again in terms from China, perhaps. So the world has been borrowing across from here and there and making margins of you know, us and them is at one point very, um, I think, it's useful. It's not unuseful. But then you know, beyond that, it, it doesn't serve a purpose. Of course, Shahid al deserves a, a, a unique critical tool. And that is what we have been talking here. 
that they, uh, that even if you talk of magic realism, that magic realism is distinct. And that magic realism is not Western. That magic realism is Latin American. I'm by West, I don't mean, I'm, I'm in the North. So, you know, uh, have, uh, dealing with Shohid al Jawid and dealing with his unique language, it is not really only magical realism. It's not only, say, surrealism or, 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 or whichever way you go or extra realist uh, techniques attempts. He's, of course, unique and, and distinct. And that unique, distinct uh, 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 verb that he has. And the critical and uh, the tool that he has evolves has evolved already in the discussion that we have been having, and none of us are really bringing in by bringing in Western critical uh, terminology or authors. We are not really subscribing to a whole, um, uh, I mean, en masse following of those tools. And finally, what I'm trying to say is, or unfortunately, we have, uh, 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 Europe and the North America, the North has really worked more than we have in terms of developing newer ideas because of various institutions that they have and the money that they have and, the, and of course, the social structure that they have. Uh, by, by, the, by the I mean, I mean definitely North America and Europe. I've, I've, I've been, a, been, been a Fulbright scholar to the United States uh, twice. I've taught there, so I know what, what I'm talking about. But at the same time, what I'm, what I'm really also trying to say is that borrowing those things doesn't make me any less Bangladeshi by, by borrowing those things. Because finally, what Johid is Johid. Shohid al Johid will not be diminished if I, if I bring in magical realism. Because finally, when you read it, and finally, when you put on stage, he is Shohid al Johid and he speaks his, his own unique way of speaking. Now, uh, we are using certain terminologies to make sense to communicate. And the terminologies that we have used here is so heterogeneous that in this, in this discussion that we have had here, it's so heterogeneous that itself has created what you're trying to say. Uh, and, and, and I really wouldn't like to make this distinction of West and East and, and you know, Orient. And, and after Edward Said, I think Orient is, is, is non-existent. I think we, we can borrow and speak from anywhere we like and to shape our unique and distinct language. In, our, in my theater, I've borrowed from Russia. Is that West? I've borrowed from Japan. Is that West? I've borrowed from Narte Shastra. Is that West or Orient? Or is just Narte Shastra do for me? It does not. So I mix Narte Shastra with, with Stan Slavisky and with, uh, with uh, uh, Tadashi Suzuki from Japan and, and Meirhol from Russia. So that makes my unique sense. And when I'm speaking and making a work of Shahid al-Jawid, that is very distinctly uh, the, uh, a Bangladeshi, I think, because it is speaking to Bangladeshi people rooted in Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jamal Hamid. Uh, Nahreen, if you want to take that up. Um, I want, uh, I second what Professor Jamil Ahmed ha has said, and I also believe that um, it's really hard to categorize Shahidul Zahir as postmodernist, modernist, or realist, or you know, uh, magic realist. Um, and in this light, um, I want to mention the debate between the very famous debate between Lukács and Brecht about what is modernism and what is realism and why certain texts are not considered modernism. So um, by saying that, uh, even if I say that, I do not really uh, believe, I do not really subscribe to the idea that the, the type of um, the type of this alternative mode of representation that develop in, in this part of the world are, are derivatives of the Western um forms but i think that uh, yes like professor jamil said that we uh, that zahir uh, uh borrowed or maybe he was inspired uh from from say marquez's uh magical realism because i read this interview of shaidul zahir on the internet um and he mentioned that i i cannot really state the source because i've forgotten I was reading so many things that I forgot it. So yeah, he said that he drew inspiration from from magic realism, but then the type of magic realism that developed in through his novellas are unique. They have their own geographical peculiarities. The way Zahir uh, maps Puran Dhaka, the way he um, you know provides this uh, urban landscape. 
and uh, like uh, Mr. Iqbal Hasna was saying that um, the way he saying he says that perhaps this happened or that happened, perhaps no, the other thing happened. The the use of word perhaps I think uh, that's his style. So uh, this different type of representation developed in a different way in this part of the world, and I also agree that uh, I think a writer, a, an author, or any literary person grows as they borrow and uh, from other cultures. And in this regard, I want to, I really want to end this speech or the, my answer with um, referring to uh, the very famous Communist Manifesto where um, Marx and Engels said uh, that uh, it was a very, uh, very famous quote that national one-sidedness and narrow-mindedness um, uh, uh, become more and more impossible. And through various local and national literatures, a world literature arises. So I think that he also, they all are also um, telling us not to be really narrow-minded or, you know, pigeonhole ourselves, but to be open-minded and borrow and by borrowing, develop our own unique styles. Thank you so much, Nahreen. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure to listening to all of your very thoughtful, insightful um, uh, opinions, vision, perceptions, you know, uh, sharing with the audience. Um, and, and, and I look forward to have uh, many more future conversations with you. Um, and uh, we just have <laughs> gone over two hours. Time just flew by. Um, so uh, I, I thank you all very much. And uh, uh, what I have uh, taken from Ramada is that you know uh, is that how Rana, Ramada is an organic uh, a networker. You know he has a way of connecting with people. So probably I will go under Ramada's tutelage someday to actually know how to connect with all these people. So and to be able to engage in conversation, I uh, I would definitely want to hear uh, more. Uh, uh, Professor from Professor Jamil Hamid in future as well, understanding that um, where are we going uh, particularly um, wrong or what's happening that you know the narrative the single story and I I'm just you know borrowing I I don't know I I feel like you know I censor myself a lot before <laughs> saying things that I want to say it feels like the uh, Foucauldian <laughs> panopticon exists in my consciousness. Uh, because of a uh, lot of socioeconomic realities. <laughs> Professor Ahmed, you wanted to say something? No, no, your Foucauldian panopticon is very, very apt, very apt metaphor for, you know, the way you speak. And uh, one never knows what will happen beyond this anyway, but yeah. please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I thank you all, you know, for uh, uh, participating. I want to end with you know, each of your uh, concluding remark, and, uh, you know, that will be end for our conversation, uh, starting with uh, Ramada. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, no concluding remarks. You know, I, I'm terribly excited uh, and will remain until I finish my Shoridul Zori translation project. Uh, I hope by the end of next year, three, four books will uh, be done. And uh, there was a point of time when I hadn't heard his name. And then now we are having this discussion. You know, such a huge transformation takes place uh, in a short amount of time by a chance incident. Uh, and then many other people are also involved in that. So that is life. So I'm just celebrating that uh, quality of life. Thank you, Ramada. Uh, Mr. Iqbal Hasnu. The mic tech I'm mute for the way. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I am all reading this discussion 
And it is my firm belief that uh, Shahid al Jahir will be explored and analyzed further by the <coughs> new readers and also the beyond uh, Bengal uh, through this translation. And uh, I'm always amazed at uh, the depth of his, his knowledge about history and the things. Uh, one aspect I would like to mention that uh, in his uh, works, most of the time, uh, there is a, a, a technique he deployed to uh, express the conception of time in the subcontinent, that, that our civilization, especially the when the West look at the subcontinent, the civilization, their concept of time is different. It's not linear. It is not compartmentalized. It is cyclical, it's something like that. A kind of uncertainty is always there. I think Shahidul Jahir's works, uh, he actually, through his works, he captured this, this aspect very cleverly. Uh, and that's why he dealt with the numbers uh, very much. And when his polyphonic voice talk, they always express and uh, what do you call Gautamanoti, that is a uh, past participle, in a way that actually the protagonists are not sure about whether it happened or when did it happen, whether yesterday or the So this kind of things is, uh, I think the, you, the this uniqueness, and by the way, I'm just trying to correct, uh, well, I never intend to mention that, that the, uh, the need for a theorization is not should be uh, for Bangladesh. I never use term Bangladesh. I myself always Bangladesh because it's linguistic, cultural identity I prefer. But what I try to express is that whether his uniqueness demand a new kind of theorization on our part. So I think this is also another aspect I mentioned that it is he expressed, he captured the very uh, unique perception of time in the subcontinent. That's all. Thank you. Mute. Are you waiting for someone to speak? I was requesting. I was requesting Sharoza. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't hear. Sorry. So sorry. Um, it was an absolute honor and privilege for me to be able to work with Ramada because he allowed me to do it, to translate this amazing text. It also. Um, it also inspired me to do go further with it and do my graduate research on it. I'm also thankful to Mr. Firoz Alum for organizing this wonderful webinar and uh, by you know inviting wonderful people. When I first watched the stage play by Professor Jamil Ahmed, I because that was after I read the novella and i could that those two things happened one after the other that i could you know see um you know i could uh follow it and i could see how professor jamil ahmed uh brought that into the stage and how he introduced his own style and then zahir's style and it was a wonderful experience i enjoyed it thoroughly i had goosebumps i especially loved the the huge figure of Abul Khair. I found personally found that to be really magical. So lastly, I want to thank uh, Mr. Iqbal Hasnu for your Bangla journal. And I, um, I got to read one of the issues that was given to me by Ramada. And it is a very wonderful initiative. So 
thank you once again, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sharoza. <laughs> um, I would like to request uh, uh, Professor Jamil Ahmed to uh, conclude our discussion with a few words about what is your thought on the future of theater and play in order to building political consciousness in Bangladeshi context? <laughs> I know, I can see that beautiful smile on Sar's face. <laughs> uh, political consciousness is always there. You know, you're never apolitical. But the problem, the, the main problem now, I think, is that, you know, after after 90s, after early 90s, we have become, our theater practitioners have become, uh, they are following this dictate, dictum that, uh, that one particular party is pro uh, uh, liberation and so we should support that party wholeheartedly whatever the party does now that is i think very 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 foolish because that doesn't help anybody uh, uh and, and i mean in various critiques in various ways if there is not criticism then it doesn't help uh, help us in any way so i think the first thing that we really need to do in bangladesh if it really has to go move forward is move out of this shell and be prepared to know to understand that if we love somebody we can very much we can critique that person very much too love and respect doesn't mean that servility not love and respect doesn't mean that you, you have to bow down but your love and respect means you can question that person even more and that by that i mean sheikh mujib by that i mean the prophet and by that whoever is so very dear in your heart so that is very important and to go to the extent that that we need we should not st stop we should not fall short of, of of questioning anything anything and everything can be questioned i think i think it was the japanese i read somewhere that uh, this this aspect of again european aspect of civilization of relentlessly questioning and not stopping not stopping because you you bow down to somebody you respect somebody or you think you defer somebody but but be relentlessly questioning anything and anybody so that you you arrive at something it doesn't it doesn't diminish anybody my questioning of Allah, my questioning of, of the Prophet, my questioning of, of, uh, of, of, of Sheikh Majid, because Malik Allah will know what is in my heart. And I don't need any, any Malavi to tell me whether I'm right or the wrong, because I read the Quran and the rest I will answer my, my, my Allah if, if he's there. So, you know, at that, at that stage, we really need to uh, move and we really need to be very clear in Bangladesh. Unfortunately, that ethos was there till in the 70s and 80s. But after that, we have really uh, withdrawn ourselves from it. And, uh, and there we really need to be very, very strong and very clear and ethically upright that we are not doing it to, to get an Ekushe Padok or get a, or whatever, a, a, a grant or whatever. We, those little dreams we, we need to give up. And then we really need to work and question anything and anybody. That perhaps is very necessary for us. And that is not there. And uh, 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 beyond that, I really need to thank you all for giving me this uh, this uh, this this uh, wonderful opportunity. Every time I speak of uh, Shoydul Jahir of this novel, it really brings up a lot of emotions and, and memories. And thank you because it, every time it reminds me of 1971. Every time I know, you know, here that where I belong and why where I need to na navigate. And please believe me, in spite of my English, in spite of my quoting whatever, Europe and wherever, I, I love my Bangladesh in my way. And I don't have to prove anybody that I'm more or less of a Bengali than anybody else. So I have done my work. I know my work. I know my theater. I know my roots and I know where I'm going. Uh, and there are a lot of things I don't know and I'm trying to learn. And thank you for bringing up this opportunity of re-questioning and re-evaluating myself and, and, and also for being able to see this production and this very wonderful novel that evokes 71 so very clearly. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, sir. I never had the good fortune of being a, one of your students in your class, but it feels like your thoughts. And you know, I will always be for every student, you know, the vision, the ideology, the unquestioning position that you carry in your heart, in your soul. So, you know, it was an absolute, you know, uh, um, privilege to listen to all of you. I wish you all a wonderful day. Bangladeshi Shawai Mane, have a great day. Uh, sorry, night. <laughs> Canada, they have a great day. Shawai Bhavatakbin, Allah Hafiz. Bye-bye.